Hey everybody, Jeff Antoniak here. Welcome to Digging Deeper Jazz. Well, today we're gonna take a break from the last 75 videos we've done. These videos are always for all instruments. This should be applicable to any instrument from drums to guitar to trombone to saxophone. Today, I've had so, so many requests from sax players to talk a bit about equipment and a bit about saxophone tone. So we're gonna do that in two-parter. I want everybody though to hang out, whether you're a drummer or a guitar player, I want you to hang out for the first part of this discussion because we are going to talk about tone and we're going to do it in an interesting sort of historical perspective way that I think might be a little informative. So uh, we'll dig in that way. Okay, well, so let's talk about this tone stuff. I actually was at the Jazz Educators Network convention, did some presenting there, and I was at the saxophone, the International Saxophone Symposium. This is going to be geeky, right? Like there is such a thing, International Saxophone Symposium. And they asked me to do a workshop on jazz, and I decided to talk about jazz tone a little bit, the sound of our jazz saxophone. Now this was an interesting presentation to plan for, uh, interesting meaning hard, in a couple ways. One, there were students all the way from middle school and high school, up through college students, up through adult semi-pros and amateurs, like so many of you out there, up through like full-on professional players. So a wide range of ability. Now here's the other thing. There were also a lot of classical players in the room and a lot of jazz players. There was about 100 people there. So um, radically different styles, radically different levels. So I wanted to talk about something that maybe was useful for everybody. And so I'd be happy actually to send you the little handout that I gave at the symposium. If you're interested, I'll put it up on the... Uh, on the screen right now. But uh, if, if you're interested, just send me an email, diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com, and I'll send it off to you. So I tell you what, here is the approach that I took. Um, I've heard it explained this way, a great jazz saxophone sound, and this is the best way I can think to explain it, is we want to go for a subtone. Now I know there's non-sax players listening, just hang with me on this. A subtone is uh, sort of a stylistic style of, uh, of tone that we hear sometimes. So that kind of foo-foo, fluffy tenor saxophone that we would hear Lester Young or Ben Webster playing, it's very often in the low range of the horn. And it's usually played softer. Uh, maybe that's the sub part of subtone. We see this written on big band charts. Subtone. So when, once you get to be a pretty decent player, you figure out how to do that subtone sound. Now, here's the way I want to think about it. I want to think about it like we want to get that subtone sound in all registers at all volumes. So I've heard this said before, and that kind of confused me when I heard it. How do you play something that's by definition low? How, how does that sound when you play it high? or something that's by definition soft, playing it loud. So I had to think that through, a subtone. That airy kind of sound. So uh, before we get into the actual exercise, here's what I want to tell you. Uh, now, I'm not sure if you guys are impressed with this whole situation yet. Get ready to be super impressed. I have a master's degree in ethnomusicology, no kidding, from uh, North Texas. Ethnomusicology. That's like nine syllables. That's, that's a super impressive degree, if you ask me. Um, so ethnomusicology is studying music from other cultures. So one thing I remember learning, I studied a lot of West African music, and I actually lived in Nigeria as a little kid. I lived in Benin City in Nigeria in third and fourth grade. So the African aesthetic of sound is different than the European aesthetic of sound. A classical saxophone player, a classical flute player, a classical uh, trumpet player are going for this sort of pure sound, right? That pure classical sound. A classical singer, that purity of sound. Now in jazz and rock, it's actually quite different. And this comes from West Africa, right? Because that is the roots of gospel and funk and R&B and country and rock and jazz and blues is this West African uh, sound, right? And so the sounds in West Africa, a pure sound is actually not a beautiful sound. 
So uh, in Africa, uh, marimbas and xylophones, they were invented in Africa. They would be these logs put over a hole in the ground and you would tune them and play them as a melodic instrument. Well, so guess what? They would put these dried, hard spider's nests, of all things, that had a rattle to them. They would put those in the ground so that when you hit the bar, it, there would be a rattle to it, right? Or uh, I remember in the 70s living in Africa, seeing instruments, string instruments, or a kora, some of those cool West African instruments with bottle caps put in the side, partly for visual decoration, but partly because they would jingle, right? A kalimba very often has some rattles on it. So this idea that the sound should not be pure. So think about jazz. We have this perfectly good cymbal, so what do we do? We put rivets in it to make it sizzle a bit. We have a drum, what do we do? We put snares on it, right? We have a perfectly good guitar sound when the electric guitar came out, so what was the first thing a blues musician did? Distorted that sound, right? So we, we can play with a pure saxophone sound, but instead we want some air. We want to bend the sound and we want to get some harmonics and some buzz and all that kind of stuff. So that's what this is all about, that aesthetic of do we want a pure sound or do we want a little something else going on in the sound. So you can think about the instrument you play. Now are there jazz players that played with a more pure sound? Paul Desmond, yeah, on and on. We can name them, right? So sure, there are examples of a more distorted guitar sound, a much cleaner guitar sound, but it's an interesting, to think of, an interesting thing to think of, that idea about purity of sound and understanding where it comes from. It literally comes from the West African perspective on what beauty is. Okay, interesting enough, ethnomusicology. There you go. So let's talk about this tone thing on the saxophone, and this will be sort of part one of the video, and then we'll go on to part two, where we'll actually talk about some cool bits of equipment that I recently ran across at, uh, at some of these conventions I was at. So here's the deal. Here is the exercise. We want to play with some dimension to the sound. I tell you what, before I give you the exercise, here is what I hear from a lot of students. These could be adult students. These could be high school students. I say, play me a note. Okay, they play a note. Maybe not that <laughs> right on, but they play the note. And now I say, okay, play it softer, and they go. So it's like a light switch. It's on or off. So there's a lack of control there, right? Um, I, I've heard this a million times, that there's sort of this one sound. They can't get softer, especially on lower notes, which are harder, right? Here is the exercise. I want you to play a sound. I want you to play, but play with so little embouchure support that no sound comes out. So in other words, I can go. That was two lungfuls of air, and I'm a little dizzy right now from doing that. I just dumped my entire body full of air out, and no sound came out. Why was that? There was no pressure on the reed, right? So I'm going to do it again. That was it. So now, by the way, that's the first step. Can you do that? Can you loosen your embouchure so much that you don't make a sound? That is hard for a lot of us to do. For a lot of us, we have immature sounds, let's call it sounds without depth, sounds without dimension, because there's too much bottom jaw. So can you do that? It's actually quite challenging for a lot of people. You start there. So now what I want is as you're doing that, add the slightest amount of pressure and see if you can get a 1% volume to come out, like almost inaudible. So I'm figuring a low D. Could you hear that in there? There was way more air than there was that sound, but it was there. Let me do a bit more. So did you hear how at first the, the sound jumped out a little bit too much, I backed off, and then I got it. So that's the exercise. Can you play at one or two percent volume because your lower jaw is so off the reed, so little pressure? So I want to hear a ton of air and very little note. I'll go up a half step.
that was two lungs full of air. I didn't last very long. And again, I'm a little bit dizzy from doing this. So that is the exercise. It is so dang hard. It, it took me a good week or two as a professional musician when I was first showed how to do this. It's a big deal. As we go higher on the instrument, it gets harder to do. Let's jump up an octave. So you heard that trying to balance that note. This is the exercise. I can go up another octave, subtone on the highest note on the saxophone. It never occurred to me until a couple of years ago that that was even possible or why you'd want to do it. Why do you want to do this? The idea is, first of all, going back to that West African aesthetic, we're learning how to get some dimension in our sound. Now, there are people who play with a very bright modern sound. Dave Sanborn comes to mind. He essentially invented that sort of style of sax playing. Or, uh, oh, why am I spacing out on his name from Tower of Power and Saturday Night Live? Well, as soon as I quit thinking about it, I'll get it. Um, great modern players, but who have depth and dimension to their sound. When I hear a lot of players playing with a, sort of a brighter, more modern tone, it's, again, it sounds like a light switch. Their sound is on and off. There's no bottom to it. There's no depth. I feel like I'm getting sort of hit with a plate of glass. It's this two-dimensional feeling I get. Whereas when I hear a mature, what I, what I like for a saxophone sound, it's enveloping me. I feel like I can walk into it and look around the tone. There might We might call it air, we might call it harmonics, there's a buzz, etc., etc. Very different than a classical tone. One is not better or worse, they're different. This is how we develop a mature, classic saxophone sound. So I'm talking about 50s, Blue Note, Dexter Gordon, John Coltrane kind of saxophone sound. <laughs> And then you work with it. Then you make your personal artistic decisions. How much air do I want? Do I want any air? I can still play with a big, bright R&B kind of saxophone sound, but it has depth to it because of this practice. And think about how much air you're moving, right? You're moving all this air. So now, of course, how does this apply to the drums or to the trombone or whatever? Well, I think just having this conversation with yourself about the depth of your sound is it, in my way of thinking, is it a two-dimensional painted on sound or is there something to it? Is there a depth or a dimension to the sound? And working with air, these are wind instruments, right? We get that. Now, one of my favorite singers ever, Stevie Wonder, right? When he sings higher, somehow his voice gets bigger and thicker and more stuff in there, more junk in the trunk, right? It's crazy when you, you know, as my voice goes higher, it gets thinner. I'm not a trained singer, of course, but it gets thinner and, you know, shrill, right? So yet when he sings higher, it gets bigger and deeper in something, right? That's what I'm talking about. Stevie Wonder knows what this is, right? So when you listen to a great singer like that, Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about with tone, relating it to this West African idea of beauty and, um, and giving us sax players a way to uh, proceed from air. So the exercise is air, not embouchure. You're, you're moving air through the horn, not controlling the horn with embouchure. This may relate for a trombone player or for a... Uh, trumpet player or for a flute, flute player who's wanting to play jazz and see what they can do to kind of beef up their sound a little bit. Interesting stuff to mess with. So I tell you what, part two of the video right away, we'll uh, jump into some interesting equipment that I uh, recently came across. And again, if you're interested in this handout, I'd love to send it to you. Just write me at diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com. Back in a second. All right, and now for the uh, serious saxophone geek fest. So I've had lots and lots of uh, people sort of asking me about equipment, and so let's dig into what I've played for quite a while, and then dig into three new things that I'm actually digging quite a bit that I've sort of gotten recently. So uh, I played a Selmer Mark VI for decades and decades, and about three years ago, I think literally three years ago this week, I started playing an Eastman 
52nd Street. And it's an incredible horn. I've been endorsing their instruments uh, for a while at the saxophone symposium. I was working with Roger Greenberg there. And at the Gen Conference, I was able to hang out with Bob Mincer and Ralph Torres, guys who, you know, play this instrument and, you know, help develop it. So it's a great horn. And, um, and for the longest, well, really for 30 years, I've been playing, let me adjust my read here. For 30 years, I've been playing uh, auto link mouthpieces. And then um, I ended up getting a Ted Klum focus tone, which is what this is. Which is very much link-like. It's a fantastic uh, mouthpiece that Ted made. And uh, so essentially I've been playing links for 30 years. You could, you know, links or link style mouthpieces. So that's it. And by link, I mean auto link. All right, cool. So um, I got hooked up, uh, Daddario Music and Kristen were very, very kind to hook me up with a uh, mouthpiece that they're making now called uh, the Select Jazz. And this is a D8 M. The eight is the size of the mouthpiece. Daddario Select Jazz. Now this is based on my friend Jeff Coffin's mouthpiece. Jeff has been playing a mouthpiece made by Freddie Gregory, great mouthpiece maker. Uh, and this mouthpiece was made a long time ago. It's what Jeff's played for a long time. Jeff worked with Daddario to come up with essentially a copy of his mouthpiece that you can't get anymore. So uh, the, the Select Jazz tenor mouthpiece is based on Jeff Coffin's Freddie Gregory. And it's actually what Jeff is playing now. I was hanging out with him last week, and um, he's not playing his Freddie Gregory anymore. He's literally playing one of these things. So I'll play it for you in just a little bit. Um, but it was it, it's a cool mouthpiece. It's very different than mine. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm used to it yet. I've been sort of playing it on and off for a week. And, you know, I'm not going to have these digging deeper videos turn into product reviews, because that's not what I want to do. That's not what I'm good at. It's not why you're here. But enough people have asked I wanted to talk about it. So let me play, let me go back and forth between the Ted Klum and the new Select Jazz. The Ted Klum is like super duper expensive. Like I don't recall, I don't want to get it wrong, but like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money and well worth it. The Select Jazz I think is around 200 bucks. So for a pro mouthpiece, that's, that's pretty good. So here's uh, the Ted Klum that I usually play. So I don't have the world's greatest audio equipment here, so I'm not sure you know, exactly what we're hearing. To me, this one, um, it, I feel like I can get louder with it. Um, I've had people listen to it and say that it's both darker and brighter than the other one, depending on how hard you push it. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it's easy to play, easy to play. It's easier than the other one, easier than the clum that I have. Um, and so far, every single read that I put on this thing plays. It's not the case with the other one. So I'm just saying, like if this is easy to play, every read plays. There's a complexity with the other mouthpiece that I think I like, but now I've played it for 30 years or played something like that for 30 years. I played this for not even close to 30 hours. So um, I'm interested in knowing if maybe uh, I would get my sound back on this and something a little more. I think I might. At any rate, this is something that I'd really, uh, you know, encourage you to check out. It's a pretty phenomenal mouthpiece. Um, and you can listen to Jeff Coffin playing this thing, right? So Daddario Select Jazz, it's a good one. And now the um, ligature I'm playing on this, I wanna thank George and John from Rovner Products who hooked me up with this Rovner Van Gogh ligature. And, um, it's really interesting. You know, I mean, maybe some of us remember the, you know, the original 
robbed or ligatures that would really sort of deaden or darken the sound. And that's good for some mouthpieces, right? This one's really interesting. I tried some other ligatures um, on this mouthpiece, and this ligature like has a big sound. That may be news to you that ligatures have a sound or that they can. This, uh, it's again, a really free-blowing big sound. It opens up the horn like like I was playing some other, you know, perfectly good ligatures on this uh, horn and this one, uh, or rather with this mouthpiece. And I like this one a lot and it's very different than some of the other Robners I had. And at the saxophone symposium, I heard a lot of people play a lot of the different Robner products. And it was amazing how bright some of the Robner stuff would sound. And, you know, again, to a lot of us that remember the old school Robners, that may be a little, uh, you wouldn't think, right? So they've actually got a pretty cool line of stuff now that are worth checking out so you know to me this is the pair right here with the select jazz Dario mouthpiece I'm gonna be you know keeping messing around with the Robner uh, Van Gogh so thank you guys for hooking me up with that so the last thing I want to <laughs> mention is crazy like I remember hearing this a couple of years ago and I'm like yeah whatever a sterling silver neck screw this is an Ishimori neck screw made out of sterling silver that my friends at Tenor Madness hooked me up with. So thank you to Randy, thank you to Simon, thank you to everybody else that were there. And so they were telling me that diff that this neck screw would make a difference. And uh, it actually shockingly makes a noticeable difference. I've played for other players, sax players and non-sax players, and they can hear a difference with a silver neck screw. Who would have thought? Well, people that have experimented with this stuff know it's a real thing. Um, on this horn, one of the things that I didn't like, the middle D was a, had a little bit too much harmonic stuff going on. The D would spread or something between the mouthpiece and the horn, whatever. There were a couple funny things about the horn that this actually makes a noticeable difference. Ishimori, Sterling silver, neck screw, through Tenor Mattis. They'd be a great, great guys to get it from. So I'm playing with this thing. Uh, I actually don't know where I put the other neck screw. I'd go back and forth. So anyway, this isn't supposed to be the world's greatest A, B, back and forth uh, video for comparing stuff. And again, that's not what I do. I'm not going to be doing much more of it. But so many people have asked about the equipment that I wanted to point out these three very cool new things. Am I going to change mouthpieces? I'm not sure, but I am going to play this for a couple weeks or a month and see what I come up with. The ligature, it's definitely great. So, you know, whatever whatever mouthpiece I need a ligature for, I'm going to be looking at this. And yeah, <laughs> the, the Ishimori neck screw, this sucker works, so I'm, I'm going back to that. Let me put a photo up for you. So I mentioned this to uh, one of my adult students. Here's what he came up with. And uh, he came up with this in a serious way. This guy is uh, an experimenter and a gearhead at heart. He put this big C clamp on his saxophone. And of course, he's not gonna play gigs like that, but you know, he was experimenting and adding mass and taking mass and, you know, experimented with different things as, you know, that's how these things are, are come up with. And he noticed that that C clamp actually did some positive things to the horn. And again, it, it will dampen some harmonics. It will amplify others. And uh, so I'm probably not going to have a C clamp on my saxophone the next time you see me, but uh, I will probably have this silver thing on here. So anyway, um, yeah, the last thing I'll say is these videos are sponsored by Gonzalez Reads. I've been using Gonzalez Reads for years. They're a great sponsor of the videos, and they're fantastic reads for sure. So that's the rundown of what I play, and that's the rundown of three new products, the Robner Van Gogh uh, Ligature, the Daddario Select Jazz Mouthpiece, and uh, the Ishimori uh, screw, neck screw from Tenor Madness. So interesting stuff to check out. I can I can tell you they're good stuff and uh, we'll see what I end up playing a month or two from now. So thank you for tuning in and uh, as always get in contact with me at diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com. Um, we've had we have 70 or 80 videos up. We have some very very cool uh, concepts and ideas coming up in the next week. So uh, get signed up on the list and we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Take care.